Afternoon, everyone. I uh, hope you've all been well fed after the, the lovely lunch downstairs. Um, before I start, I'd probably just like to give you a bit of background about why I'm here and why I'm the person talking to you about data privacy. Um, I'm kind of coming at this problem from two angles. Uh, the first is, I guess you could call it academia. Um, I recently finished my last few months in secondary school back in June. Um, that's high school if you're from the States or I don't know, in Estonia, it's probably called secondary school as well. Um, but I had always been interested in kind of computer science, data privacy, and, and sort of the, cryptog uh, the cryptography aspect of keeping information secret for a long period of time. Um, and I entered a national science fair in Ireland called the BT Young Scientist, which is the longest running science fair in the world. Um, it was my fourth time entering with four different projects. Um, they ultimately gave me the overall award because I just wanted to get rid of me or something. I felt very bad about entering three times. I thought four was a better number, so I entered four times um, and then won it for a project called QCrypt, um, which was basically a, a way of keeping information secret and the sort of general concept was that information should be secret for life. Um, and there was a few different ang angles to that, um, but it was something that sparked a lot of commercial interest. So from the press fallout from that, I woke up the next morning with about 20 or 30 emails in my inbox from different companies saying, we struggle to keep our information secret. Can you help us and turn it into a product? Which is a great way to start a company. There's not many people that are in that position. Um, and it meant I kind of hit the ground running uh, in terms of building out the team and kind of getting the technology up and running there. Um, and that's sort of where it spins into the second aspect, which is the commercial side. Um, I guess traditionally data privacy has kind of been focused on addressing one question, which is how do we protect the information that individuals give to companies? And that's, it's a losing battle and it's an uphill struggle because on one hand you've got people that still write their password under their computer keyboard. Then on the other hand you've got more kind of technical exploits and, and hacks. Um, and the crux of that is that it's causing major kind of financial and brand damage to companies. They know they need to do something about it, but they just don't know how to go about it because their internal processes are a mess and they rely on, we'll say the laws of the legislature or the judiciary instead of the laws of mathematics and technology, which I think are a lot more unbreakable. Um, which brings me on to kind of the, the crux of the, the overall kind of holistic problem. Um, and that problem is that personal data is scattered across the web. As soon as you give your information to one company, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Google, you don't know where that information went, and it's effectively out of your control at that point. And it's really, really difficult for individuals because the process of reclaiming that is, up till now, effectively impossible. Um, and as I mentioned, the regulatory frameworks and the, the legal frameworks are something that the, the, um, the regulators are struggling to keep up with the, the sort of the problem, and they're, they're kind of creating these new laws like uh, GDPR, CCPA in California, and it's not working. Uh, some companies think they're kind of regulatory compliant, but that does not mean that they have good data privacy processes internally. It's fairly well known that data privacy is a major problem internationally. You just have to look in a newspaper, and you see that companies like Equifax, Uber, um, you've got kind of Yahoo, all these other companies are struggling with it. And it's been estimated that there's been 6.8 billion personal accounts hacked to date. Um, and that's a number way greater than anyone has ever imagined. I did a little survey internally, um, sort of in, uh, in, in my local university, and only 20% of people thought that that number was above 50 million. Um, so that's you know, a major discrepancy. But what's happening now is that people are realizing that it's a problem, both from companies and as individuals. As I mentioned, you've got regulations like GDPR, CCPA, uh, HIPAA for um, sort of health information compliance in the US. And these are all coming together and creating kind of different problem sets that are somewhat mutually exclusive. And it's really, really difficult to kind of cohesively go after all three of them or, and, and all the other kind of legislations that are available in different countries or, or sort of enforced in different countries with one single canonical solution. On the other hand, you've got people. And people are generally becoming more privacy savvy. Um, not only because of the headlines, but because they realize that data is something that's really valuable to them. It's a difficult thing to quantify, but it's still something that they're really, really concerned about. And people are beginning to be kind of distrustful of companies like Facebook and like Google um, after all the problems they've been having. And then thirdly, there's business risks. Um, companies are suffering major losses and their brands are being destroyed. Cambridge Analytica wasn't a great example of a brand being destroyed because Facebook is still kind of in use because of Instagram and WhatsApp. Facebook as a platform is kind of dying. As a company, they're staying where they are because they've got Instagram, they've got WhatsApp, and they're buying up every company that's somewhat competitive to them. And then that's how they're growing. So they're a little bit different. But um, there's a few other companies that it's, it's causing major trouble for, like Equifax. Um, there's a Facebook Messenger bot that you can use to sue Equifax now. 
and it's the easiest $25,000 you can ever make. It generates all the legislation paperwork, or uh, sorry, the, the litigation paperwork. You walk into a court in New York or California, you lodge it there, and then six weeks later you get a check for like 25K. It's crazy. I haven't done it myself, but I've heard it's very, very easy. But that's just an example of where um, it's, it's apparent that it's a major problem for these companies. On the other hand, it's a little bit more interesting, I think. The technology is now at a point where traditional approaches to cryptography just aren't feasible anymore. Things like centralized databases are massive problems, not only because of the physical risks of keeping information in one location, but also having a single kind of target in terms of cybersecurity is a major challenge. If you penetrate one network, you've effectively got an entire data set for an entire company, and that's a, a pretty big problem. Secondly, and, and this is one that a lot of people haven't realized yet, is um, quantum computers, when they become feasible and scalable, um, and at a sort of, at a level where they're widely adopted, will render existing cryptography schemes broken. Um, this is through two, pro uh, two algorithms. One's called Shor's algorithm, and the other's called Grover's algorithm. Um, and they can effectively, uh, the Shor's algorithm can factor really, really large integers in polynomial time, which is very quick, uh, basically. Uh, and then Grover's algorithm can kind of basically uh, speed up the, uh, the, the way of decrypting symmetric encryption uh, by n squared, which, again, is a major uh, a major concern for existing schemes because this is what's used all over the internet. Every time you go to a payments website and you've got a green lock in the top corner, that's TLS, which is, is based on mo usually uh, a pros uh, an algorithm called elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, um, and they're broken with quantum computers. And then thirdly, there's new hardware approaches that allow you to separate personal data from the processing aspect through a BIOS level approach, and that's a new feature in processes, which I'll talk about in just on, on processors, which I'll talk about in just a second. So this is what we're trying to solve as a company. Um, the problem with all these different things is that they're really, really difficult to bring together, and that's what we're, we're doing. We're building really, really simple, fast, and scalable developer tools that let companies process all of this personal data in a secure way. That means that they don't have to see it, they don't have to store it, and they don't have to handle it, all in a couple of lines of code. I guess a, a decent analogy is we're trying to become like Stripe for data privacy. In the same way that you can process a credit card online in a couple of lines of code, we want data privacy to be that simple because it's something that's a really, really widespread concern. And to date, there's been no good solutions for it. And as a company, we're trying to make data secure for centuries, not just a couple of months. Like you've got, I'm not going to name any names, but there's cybersecurity companies that focus just on the upcoming threats. So it's things like quantum computing that we're concerned about. And it's things about the kind of more um, holistic or creative hacking attempts that we're, we're concerned about. So we're trying to isolate it and basically build a secure container that all this processing happens in so that there's no single point of failure and that there's um, no sort of single attack surface as well. If you look at the kind of comparisons between what we're doing and how it's worked before, it's a pretty simple sales pitch. Um, there's a lot of different technologies that come together to, to integrate all these sort of um, the, these solutions together. But I guess the most important parts are that information is never decrypted. Companies who are processing data never see it in plain text. Um, we're trying to become the canonical source of personal information for individuals all around the world. So that if you've got your Facebook account and your Netflix account, they all have one single point where they can process your personal data. And the control of that data is up to the individual, while companies never have to sacrifice any access to it at all. And they can still use it in the same way that they've used before. Um, we also provide the kind of more boring stuff like regulatory compliance, which bigger companies care about. But we're kind of going after the sort of mid-market um, of companies kind of between seed and series A, where um, we sort of we're growing with the companies as they scale. Because one or two person companies don't really care about data privacy. They just want to build their product. And really, really large companies only care about making their CIO happy or making their, their CTO happy that it's compliant with whatever new legislation is in their country. Um, so we're, we're going after that, that side of things. The enablers and, and the reason that this is happening now, there's, there's sort of four technologies. The first is something I sort of alluded to earlier, and that's hardware secure enclaves. The, uh, the most sort of popular service out there is Intel SGX, um, Software Guard Extensions. It's a technology in all Intel chips since late 2015. Um, maybe not all, but certainly all the kind of desktop and server chips that they're selling. Um, and then ARM have a similar version uh, or a similar tool that they call Trust Zone. But basically, it means that anyone with even physical or admin access on a particular server can't see what's happening inside a secure enclave, as they call it. Um, and what happens in, in, our, in our example is that the algorithm or the processing service is encrypted and pumped into the enclave. 
the secure data set is encrypted and pumped into the enclave, everything is decrypted inside there, then the result is produced and handed directly back to the individual securely in the web browser so that they can, um, they can use the service as normal. Individuals don't even know that they're using Evervault, but the company never touched the personal data and everything is intact that way. Second, there's the post-quantum security and, and cryptography schemes. Um, the most common of, or, or the most sort of tried and tested is a scheme called Entru. Um, it was created in the late 90s by, and, and then ultimately bought by uh, a company called Security Innovations. Um, and it's now sort of out of pat patents and everything, so the IP concerns aren't as much as they used to be. It's semi-open source now. Um, thirdly, you've got distributed databases. You've got MongoDB, all these tools that operate really, really well across, um, even across different jurisdictions and, and regardless of latency times between them. They're very, very good at that. And then you've got uh, other, other tools as well, I guess, on the, on the um, sort of, finally, you've got the kind of decentralized Merkle trees, as I call them. I don't like using the word blockchain for various reasons, because they're basically just Merkle trees that are run across a lot of different nodes. Um, but these mean we can basically have tamper-proof security schemes. And that's a great, way to, or a great way to be, because you've got an immutable audit chain that can show when a company or accesses a particular piece of personal data, um, and that's very, very difficult to change. So it means that there's no deniability over, um, over what happens. This is sort of a little bit of how our network looks. Um, there's kind of three angles to it. Firstly, you've got the Evervault network, which is basically um, a group of SGX-enabled nodes, Intel SGX-enabled nodes, that both stores the personal data and does all the processing. And then we host all the processing algorithms that companies deploy to us. Um, and I guess in terms of use cases, you can think of things like mint.com, where they need to process your um, your bank transaction details and then render a result that says that you spent too much money on cinema tickets or something like that. Maybe it could be a little bit different, but um, the information could be a lot more sensitive over time. Secondly, you've got the companies who have these algorithms that are deploying it. And then thirdly, you've got the individual, who are the people that need the end result. And this is sort of how we, we sort of interact with the entire process. The Intel Remote Attestation Service basically verifies whether an enclave has been tampered um, tampered with or whether there's um, any sort of software inside the enclave that shouldn't be there. So we can verify that no one has access to any of the information within the enclave and we can make sure that all the processing is happening in the way that it should be and Intel attests to that using their kind of root certificate. Um, and we're distributing that sort of point of failure across the different providers like I mentioned earlier on ARM Trust Zone and then AMD are making an attempt at it. Not very well, but it's, it's getting there. Um, but we're trying to diversify as much as possible in terms of the technology and move away from that. Um, so this is, I don't know if you can read this, but this is kind of um, a combination of different technologies and, and uh, snippets of source code that I've come across in, in my time sort of working in software. Um, for those of you who are kind of familiar with it, there's some really, really dangerous things in there. Um, and it's all over the place. No one really understands how the whole thing works. Um, you've got people who are um, you know, storing all their passwords in plain text so that if someone even accesses your, your source code in GitHub, they've got your database, all this sort of stuff. So it's a mess, basically. We're replacing it with this and making it three lines of code so that the flow for the individual is completely uninterrupted. Companies have already deployed their, their algorithms to the network and they can access whatever data sets they want as long as the individual consents to it. Uh, we're doing a trial run on, run on this with a couple of companies um, and it's working out very, very well so far. Um, we don't have much of a scalability overhead. Uh, we don't have much of a sort of latency overhead. Um, and in terms of the, the, the sort of simplicity, developers love using it, which is always sort of a great sign, especially when you're building a developer-focused tool like we are. Which brings me to this. Um, a lot of companies have concerns with how they're going to process their data. Um, and I know that this is very apparent even at conferences like this. Um, obviously, with a bit of a robotics focus, there's even more concerns, especially if it's sort of AI-driven robotics where you have large aggregated data sets um, that you need to process in a secure way. Um, and over time, we're trying to become kind of more uh, holistic, where we're solving problems that previously weren't really deemed possible in a, in a corporate setting. Um, things like medical diagnostics, where the data just isn't there because it's too sensitive. Um, you've got genomics, and then um, you know, even sort of climate modeling and this sort of stuff where you can bring in sort of micro, uh, micro metrics and, and combine them together to form kind of useful heuristics for, for problems that haven't been solved before. Um, so we're looking to work with other companies who see this as a problem and who want to make sure that data privacy isn't a concern so they can focus on, on doing what they do best, which is generally building your product, particularly if you're a sort of a web-facing or a good company. Um, so we're trying to take that headache off you. 
Um, and if you have any interest in seeing how this could work, work for you guys, um, my email's up there. Um, you'll find me around afterwards. Um, but on that note, I'd like to thank you all for listening, and I'll open the floor to any questions if anybody has any. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have some questions? We're moving on here. Here we are, lady down there. To you down there. We'll take the lady first. I just wanted to say I'm I'm an attorney, so I um, in GDPR or maybe even the US um, degrees as well. There are norms that actually help you to sell your product. There's the technical standards or market technical protection sort of skills that have to be um, used by companies. And you can say that pretty much you are, what you are providing for the market is what meets the technical standards uh, for uh, pr protecting data. We solve everything post-sale. So a lot of companies have personal data where um, it's more like a customer inquires, and then they have to look after that from a, a sort of sales pipeline perspective. But everything after you're, you've sold your product, we solve that, yeah. And it's compliant. Very good, OK. I, I was Googling you, and you didn't talk about this, but I understand your QCrypt thing also did this nice thing with sharding the data and putting it yep. in different jurisdictions. So the idea, I guess, is that you can only assemble the data if you sort of want to, basically, that you can't have someone come and, and sort of grab the servers. Have you sort of thought through um, what the kind of mechanism is, you know, legally where someone should be compelled to reassemble the data? And are you sort of thinking that, well, if someone gets an unpleasant court order, they can flush down the key so they, they still don't have to reassemble it then? Or are you still kind of assuming um, in the kind of the paradigmatic, I think the, the, the North Irish cases, right, that, yeah. um, that uh, if someone does come with a good court order and says, you know, Shane, I want you to assemble this data for me, that you'll say, okay, okay, I'll put the data together. Uh, yeah. So. The original driver for the QCRIP project was, uh, as you mentioned, a thing in, in the north of Ireland where there was a project by Boston College where basically through a, a legal agreement between the UK and the US called uh, the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty that they could compel, um, in this case, Boston College to basically divulge these depositions that had been taken on both people, on both sides of the kind of Republican dispute in, in Northern Ireland. Um, they were relying on the laws of the judiciary. And uh, I'm officially a law student as well, by the way, so I don't completely disagree with this. but. Um, I think the laws of mathematics, I mentioned this earlier, are much more kind of tamper-proof. Uh, in terms of the, um, like how, uh, how, how that actually happens in practice on the technology side, it's using a scheme called Shamir Secret Sharing, where you can basically break a file up into, let's say, five pieces with a predefined quorum of three. You can bring them all together, um, in this case, over a distributed network, and rebuild the original file. Um, and you know, that could be something like a personal will. The, um, if you interpret the legislation as it is, you cannot compel someone to do that, but it's never been tried in court before. So it's basically up to a judge to decide that. Um, and it's something that a lot of my friends laugh at me about. They're like, I'm, I'm like, you know, I'll know that my technology works if I get sued and I win. So I'm kind of waiting for a lawsuit. I mean, I'm not ready for it just yet, but as soon as we as a company get sued, and if we win, it means we're onto something. Um, I've been involved in legal disputes over other things, but I won't go into that. Um, but on the, on the pure kind of data privacy side, it's a really, really interesting space. But because GDPR and, and the sort of just data privacy like, um, regulations are so nascent, we just don't know yet. And it's up to the European Commission to decide that. Okay. Any more questions out there in the audience? All right. Going, going. Go on, please. Thanks, Shane Curran. Thank you, sir. Thank you.